seconds to give Will some buffer for editing. That worked out really well last time. I think it was almost like, I think I had to cut out like all of 10 seconds. And again, we were right at one minute. One hour. Yep. Welcome to this Death Clock has <laughs> 60 Minutes, the War Machine Hordes-based podcast that is right around one hour long. We're going to talk about uh, War Machines and Hordes. War Machine and Hordes, specifically! <laughs> I wish my intro played. Somebody let his finger off the button too early. Um, today, Slippery. again, we brought uh, brought back the same guest we had a few weeks ago, Mark andre uh, We have a lovely picture of him with an orange <laughs> in his mouth and, a, and an eyebrow ring. It's, uh, if, if you're uh, watching the podcast live, you could see it. You really should tune into the podcast live, guys. That's the best way to interact with us as things happen. Of course, my co-hosts on this amazing, weird adventure that we're on are Semi-Auto Magic. Hello, hello. And Maelstrom, who's over there watching the watching the chat stream. Shenanigans. Remember, everybody, that if you are live on the Twitch stream, this show is interactive. Please say things, comment on things, ask questions, and Maelstrom will make sure that we hear about it. Give me something to do. And, of course, our <laughs> guest host this week is Mark andre Say hello, Mark andre Howdy. Mark andre who are you for those <laughs> who didn't tune in three weeks ago for our first show? I'm uh, some guy who abandoned the Ottawa meta for the uh, big city of Toronto. Uh, been here about a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I hear you're okay at War Machine and Hordes. I'm all right. I, I'm definitely like top 1,000 players in Canada. Oh, yeah. At least top. Well, I wouldn't. Uh, top 1,050. I'm going to put you in there. <laughs> um, so this week, what we're going to start right off the top, uh, let's talk about some of the new things that have uh, come out since Gen Con. Um, not a lot. Really, Gen Con kind of ended and things kind of shut down. So first things first, let's talk about the new spell that showed up on Twitter today. Boiling blood. Yeah, that looks amazing. At first I thought it was going to be a feat. And then I saw that it was a spell. And I was like, really? Yeah, at, at, point, at two cost, uh, it had a cost of two, sorry, to start with. And it's it's like the, uh, the fire... Uh, Trolls Animus, but better. You want me to do a read? Yeah, do a read. When this model suffers damage as a result of an enemy melee attack, after the attack is resolved, this model can make a ranged attack with a spray 8 and a POW 12 that causes fire damage. Models hit suffer the fire continuous effect. Models can make boiling blood attacks even while in melee. After making this attack, boiling blood expires. Boiling blood lasts for one round. All right, M.A., what's your thoughts? Well, it feels like an Animus, for sure, just yeah. because of the range self. and um, I mean, getting a free spray is nice. It doesn't stipulate that you have to target the model that hit you or that did the damage. So it's nice that you can sort of redirect it. And it also kind of gives you gunfighter sort of like for the attack. Um, I mean, it seems okay, like, being able to essentially, like, if you get charged by, say, two infantry models, you can take the hit from the first and then spray the second uh thereby kind of reducing the damage you take um mm. but it, it competes with a lot of other good animi depending on the faction where it will be found yeah totally and uh, I, it's it's pretty i mean continuous fire effect can really suck balls when it's on you but there are ways around that right guys oh yeah well um purification stuff like that that can get rid of it or just stuff that doesn't care about fire you know trollkin fire eaters or um you know whatever you're looking at the tack i guess is immune from fire right. stuff oh, like that sure. well i mean here's the thing though when they've shown animus before it usually says animus it doesn't say spell this specifically says spell at the top of that that little nugget of wisdom so i don't know my, my feeling is it's probably a spell i think it's on I a think... caster I think that's a, bo a boilerplate thing, okay. but, you could, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Oh, well, that's true. We'll find out. We'll find out soon. Next uh, topic is now that uh, now that Gen Con's over, a few new casters have shown up, but specifically the Glacier King is starting to actually be played on the board. 
Um, I don't think anybody in the Ottawa area has a Glacier King yet. We know Aggie's got one out in Kingston. We know that um, the troll player in Toronto's got one. Mm -hmm. um, the big troll player. I can't remember his name right now. I'm sorry. Um, Mark andre have you had a chance to play against the Glacier King yet? How do you feel about it? I think it's pretty good. I got to play against it with uh, Gunbjorn, which I think is a great, great spot to play him. Uh, guided fire with the uh, with the with his three shots is really where it's at. I think Privateer gave them gave trolls a way better option than the Mountain King, seeing yeah. as that it's two points cheaper and it has a gun worth using uh, again and again. George, we've talked about this a bit. Uh, or sorry, semi-automatic. We've talked about this a bit in the last couple of shows. Um, do you think Privateer Press has hit the nail on the head when it comes to the Gargantuans at this point? Uh, I think they've really found the design space they've been looking for for these heavies, or for these ultra heavies, uh, the huge base models. What um, is the design space? What, like, as you define it? It, it really seems to be um, a, a gun turret with extra abilities that can still pack a melee punch when it needs to. Gotcha. Gotcha. So they they don't seem to be using them as something that can run up the field to get like a really big hit in. You know, in some cases they can do that, but most of the time they when they're used successfully, they seem to sit back, do some real work with their ranged weapons, and then sort of the second or third wave they go in and they start taking out things that killed your front line. Right. Well, and, and my impression with uh, looking at the circle of Gargantuan, what little we know about it, is it felt like more like a support piece that could come up front later on in the game, which I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on this one. I'm, I'm not the best player in the world. But I feel that's what really shines with the Signar, with, with Stormwall, is that he plays a great support and range piece at the beginning of the game, and then at end game he can step in and do some, real, uh, some more work. Yeah. Um, Mark andre what are your thoughts on that? On, I, I think the like the way they've you know given it a gun that does some real damage is it's it's forcing engagement like you can't just sit back and ignore him uh, with knockdown I, I was sorry with his animus he also sort of punishes you for getting too close to him uh, and I mean with snowfall I mean it's just an amazing passive buff for trolls it'll trigger things like camouflage uh, so you know you, you'll have like uh, highwaymen that go up to def 16 against shoot some shooting most shooting it doesn't ignore it uh yeah no so i think i think it's a really great piece you know some people were bitter about the math five uh, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. but if with i mean with his auto stationary assuming he's not attacking something that's ignore that's immune to cold he's you know at least a mat seven in that regard Absolutely. you boost the hit once and then you're good yeah now do you think this is going to uh, sort of drag uh, Dozer and Smigs out of their semi-retirement and get more uh, troll ranged lists sort of brewing what? now that you have this big gun out there? Oh, is that just meaning you meaning like he gets bank shot or? Well, we Dozer and Smigs was released. We heard a lot of people say how awesome he was going to be and then he kind of disappeared. And I figure the reason that he would have disappeared is that there weren't a lot of troll shooty lists. And suddenly you've got this big gun that you could add into a list that has some more troll shooting in it. Um, and sort of those things tend to synergize relatively well. I think, um, I mean, I, I guess that's, that's probably worth, you know, checking out. He's, the, I think the reason why you don't see Dozer and Smeg at the moment uh, much is that the spending nine points for a single POW 14 range just isn't enough these days mm, you right. want that bomber for one point more you want um or you know warders which are usually all the time with trolls yeah or you could take calandra's you know two lights and get you know still get you know, pay eight points for that right yeah uh, so the bet you don't think the animus is enough to to see him on the table well it does require aoe so the only spot you would probably see it if you want really wanted to do a convoluted gun bjorn uh like give him snipe and uh, explosive O, so that he is now has an AOE attack that'll benefit from bank shot. I guess you could do that, but that would still only be the first attack of three. Right. Yeah. Um, Gunbjorn is probably the place to try it out, though, since he has that affinity anyway. And, and you just said you've you've already seen it be, being played played with Gunbjorn now, or sorry, the the um, I, the, the ice, glacier, king. glacier King for sure. 
I so think that's a good sign. I think that Gumbjorn is not a commonly played caster because he doesn't have the synergies aren't that. Well, as far as I feel, the synergies aren't that great to make him the one that you throw down all the time. Well, especially with Miserable Meat Mountain and uh, EE out there all the time. But I, I, I think we'll see more of. Uh, well, it's going to change the way that lists work. I'm sure. All right, guys, moving on because we've only got one minute left in this segment. Um, let's talk quickly about the we got a devastation release. We know when it's coming out. You, jo- uh, Semi, you were saying you uh, got your coins already. Yeah, well, I got my coins. Our our local uh, our local game store has a standing order. As soon as they see a release kit pop up from our distributors, they pull that kit in for us. And uh, realistically, it's one of the only ways we actually are able to continually get kits. Right. Um, what that means in real numbers is even though we won't see uh, a release until October of Devastation, I'm sitting on a sit- set of pretty, pretty coins right. that we'll be able to hand out at that event. So everybody get ready for, get your, get your hordes list together so yep. that you're ready for the release event. Our release event here in the Ottawa Meadow will be happening sometime in October. Um, hopefully I'll be around to play in that one because I love doing release events. Release events are a great way to get new players in because you, generally you can play a lot of games at lower points and still have a good chance. Of, it's also of a lot more process. relaxed than a tournament. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, yeah, you're getting points, but it's not as, shall we say, adversarial an environment. And there's also a lot more, um, shall we say, soft scores. Yeah. They're not absolutely. actually soft scores, but... Uh, well, you, there's you, points you get for points fun, for yeah. dressing up in a fun costume, bringing terrain, that type of Absolutely. thing, playing different casters, that that kind of thing. And it's really great if you aren't currently coming out to events and somehow you're listening to our podcast, this would be a really great event to come out to. I don't care where you are, sometime in the next couple of months, they're going to be running a release event. Somewhere Find out where your, your local store's release event is and... Head on out to that because Maelstrom, it'll be really will that good. be your first? It'll be my first. Yep, I'm sweet. super excited. That's I, my first awesome. one, I came yeah. out with the circle coin. I didn't expect to go home with a circle coin. I had a janky 35 point, two 35 point <laughs> lists, and <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I still came home with a coin. Yeah. Mark Andre, what about have you done a lot of release events or do you avoid those like the plague? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of plague, I just puked in my mouth a little bit. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I. I think the last one I did was the one with, I think maybe the Convergence one with the boat going up the river. Yep, that was a Convergence release. Uh, Privateer, unfortunately, doesn't tend to balance these very well. and uh, <laughs> Or at all. It's kind of why I, I, I steer clear of them. I was In that event, I was mostly just running Striker 2 into the boat uh, on turn 3 every, every game. Uh, fair, fair. All right, guys. I, I, I can't resist the urge to game the scenario, so I just... I gotcha. That, yeah, I guess that is kind of a problem. Is you kind of <laughs> take away the fun. That actually brings us pretty close to our next segment. Focus! That's actually... It's actually ripped from the forums. Because <laughs> <laughs> we as professional yeah, podcasters... We're so professional at this. We're getting really close to knowing what we're doing. We've almost improved since the last time we were on MA. All right, so... Today's topic is uh, went onto the forums yesterday, and of course the top post was a person complaining that the game is dying. You know, <laughs> oh, the sky is falling. The what? game is dying. Is, my, it, is it Wednesday it already? It is Wednesday. My meta has dissolved. I've only got three players. Um, so, what you know, to go against the sky is falling thing. But, I mean, yes, I'm sorry for the people whose metas are dissolving or getting smaller. Um, people, there are new games that come out every day. There's a new Star Wars game that comes out every, with 85 models every week. Um, there's, there's the new this game. There's the new that game. There, there's the new Kickstarter games. Hey, we'll Age of Sigmar just came and a, 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 <laughs> Age of Sigmar Sorry, I couldn't is, keep a, it's couldn't just, keep a straight face it's there. It's staged to kill War Machine entirely. <laughs> um, and so, but people move from game to game. It happens. Yep. Um, let's talk amongst us, uh, us four here about, instead of just going doom saying about the end of the game and how the metas are dissolving, our metas are actually really strong in our, I think anyway, mm-hmm. I, 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 we can all comment, I, you know, Mark andre you're in Toronto, we are not specifically part of that meta, so I can't really comment on it, it seems like it's a pretty strong meta, the Ottawa, Montreal, Kingston metas are, as far as I'm concerned, blowing up, mm-hmm. um, let's talk a bit about 
Well, let's talk a bit about the Toronto Meta. Mark, tell us, is the is the Toronto Meta growing? Oh, uh, I mean, you can't go a weekend without a tournament. Wow. I could I could throw a rock outside my window, and it would probably hit a War Machine player. <laughs> well, I think that, that that speaks to, that. as soon as you said, I can't go a week without a tournament, I think that speaks to what grows a meta. Let's talk a bit about growing metas. How do we grow a meta as as active community members and when we are specifically active community members the reason why we do this podcast the moose machine channel and everything else is because we want more people to play mm -hmm. um so starting with you sammy because this is what you do for your part of the game yeah talk to me a bit about growing a meta what do you what do you feel is the key to growing a meta as, if you see your meta dying what do you do well there's there's uh, actually a difference between having uh, a dying meta and having a absent meta, like just not having one at all. A dying meta is hard to save. Um, it is often better to let it fall over and pick up the pieces than to try and actively save it. Because the people who you are trying to convince to get back into the game are people that have left the game for a reason. Mm -hmm. And often in that case, it's better to let them leave maybe wait a month or two and then start putting up beginner events and that way you start to bring people in and then you're building a new meta without the um, baggage of that of those people who are kind of on the fence and you're sort of forcing back what you mostly want to do is um, grow that new meta and the biggest things that you can do about growing a new meta is to run events that are friendly to new players and the second and the biggest thing is consistency right creating a night when people can show up and be certain to get a game whether there are two people there on a night or 20 people there on a night is the most important thing because you're never going to get people on the first night that they see war machine being played you're going to get people on the 15th night they see War Machine being played because they're going to say, oh, I've got War Machine models or, oh, I've always wanted to see how that game is. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that they can go back and they remember, I saw those guys there, I think it was on a Sunday. Right, and then, and then, then they come back. And then they show up on a Sunday. Uh, so Maelstrom, to, to point, to, to throw things yep. in your direction, you're a newer player and we right. like to use you as our new player person. Um, that guy. When you see, <laughs> why, like, what is it about this, what, what is it that got you involved? I mean, yeah, it was a great way to meet new people, yep. but we kept you involved. Right, because it's a fun game. Because it's a fun game, but what, was it the consistency of events that really kept you? Yeah, the, every week, it's something, it's a chance to get out of the house and, and uh, go play some games. And... Right, right. Mark andre as part of a growing meta in Toronto, what do you think the key is to Toronto's growth? Why, why is it growing? We're, um... We're definitely spoiled for choice in the area. Uh, there's a few things. I mean, the game night comment, I think, is, is key. If people don't know that they're going to get a game, especially in Toronto, uh, driving out to a store is just not a, a fun idea. It's not a fun proposition. Um, personally, I really only get out to tournaments because there are so many. Uh, that's And I don't have a car, which uh, complicates things in the city. But um, I think... Like having no like that's what got me in the game is knowing there were going to be people on a Saturday I could hit up for a game. I think stuff like Facebook groups help a lot because it's a lot easier to organize games now, even if it's you know with people you don't know too well. Like we have people you know post to our group say, "Hey, uh, I'm going to be living in Toronto for the next few months or the next six months, or I'm only going to be in town for a week. Where can I go to get a game?" And within minutes, they're going to have a bunch of people kind of say, "Hey, go here. If you're staying in this neighborhood, go here." Uh, I'll play against you. I think so. I think social media is a huge plus in setting stuff like that up as well. Yeah, well, I when I, when I was going down to visit my brother in Newark, New Jersey, I posted in their local Facebook group, and I found out um, within you know minutes that I could go down a day early, the, earlier than I was planning on it, and be certain to have four games that night there was just people all ready to go <laughs> well i think in a, in a place that i had literally never been this also brings up the point that when you're part of a so use social media and at the same time help grow your social media like be an active part of social media we we talk a lot here after after having um after having some people from other podcasts on 
uh, about uh, Reddit because we are active Redditors, all of us. We are part of the Reddit community. We're part of our local Facebook community. We're part of the Ontario Facebook community. We're also part of the Privateer Press Forum community. We try to actively be part of each of those communities. But I think it's also important to say, be a positive, active part of said community. Yeah, there's going to be some ball busting go on about like gun cases, for just an example. <laughs> 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 Using gun cases to carry around. There's going to be some ball busting that goes on in those communities, but make those communities active, fun. If somebody is trying to sell their stuff, you, and you want don't don't slag their stuff off. If somebody wants to know about their li about whether their list works, don't immediately go, "Oh, come on, noob, you know, play it and find out." Be an active fun part of that community and that community will grow. That's my feeling anyway. Um, and I, I think that one of the disservices we do as being part of the internet community in, in War Machine or any part of that is that because of we have a bit of anonymity, we don't uh, we don't tend to be positive forces in that. And I think it's important to say even on the online communities, being a positive force can help grow your community. If your community's dying, then check your Facebook page. See if it's caustic. If that community's caustic, be a positive force in it. So yeah, sometimes it, can, sometimes it can be hard to be a positive force, um, in a, especially online. Um, the, the gift theory, uh, you know, and Wheaton's Law are in full effect whenever you're online. So always make sure to ask yourself, am I obeying Wheaton's Law when I post this? Okay, absolutely. And I, I'd say the Facebook groups help with that just because I, typically people's names are there. Yes. Right. So, you know, if, if some guy like is a complete jerk to you, you see him at the gaming store next week, like you'll eventually figure out who that is. Yeah. I friggin' hate that. Will then you can set guy. fire to his car. And, <laughs> uh, you know, you're good to go. Or steal the gun case out of the back of his car, which you know has all... Wait, sorry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're uniquely positioned as War Machine players. We know what's really in those gun and, you know, camera I love, cases. I love you, Devin. I'm only busting whatnot. your balls because it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, guys. So we're going to go into the next segment. Now you can hit that button. <laughs> loves that button. All right, guys, Thank this you. is Focus. This week we're going to be talking about one aspect of War Machine, of the rules. We're going to make our poor PG semi-auto magic try to spew rules like a pro. Luckily, he may have some resources at his disposal to help him this time. Um, G, this time I want to talk to you a bit about spellcasting. Spellcasting, I think, First off, when most of us are introduced to War Machine, uh, a PG introduces us and they do front of card, um, which means there is no spells. That's what I learned. We don't have to learn about them. The problem with that is, is suddenly we get spells thrown at us and often it's kind of throws us for a loophole. One thing I will let you know is that not everybody gets the front of card experience. Okay. That is something we do here locally to simplify things. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, every PG has their own way of teaching this game. Right, game. right. Um, but and that's your way. Yeah, th that in particular. So the way, way that the way that he teaches War Machine for those of you that haven't learned here, which I assume half of the people on here have learned here, but that's because I, I don't really realize that the World Wide Web is world. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's the wide and web. wide apparently. Um, <laughs> what happens is is that you teach War Machine by just letting us use the front of one uh, of the caster's card and the front of every card for all the jacks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the battle box. And that makes sure that the game is simple off, off the get-go. Yeah. But let's let's move on uh, from that. How spellcasting is actually relatively complicated. You still had to go back and remember yes. all the stuff. So well, tell me the basic rules of spellcasting. Spellcasting is almost like making a ranged attack, except not really. Um, so uh, basically, to cast a spell, pretty simple. You pay the cost of the spell. If it is a non-offensive spell and you are within the spell's range, then the spell just goes off. If it is an offensive spell, you have to make an attack roll using uh, your focus stat for a spellcaster specifically. Um, and the focus stat plus 2d6, and this is a boostable roll. And if you, as always, exceed... Uh, your target's uh, defensive value, then the spell goes off specifically. But that's on an attack spell. Yeah, as I said, on an offensive mm -hmm. spell. On a non-offensive right. spell, you don't require that. Now, I think I think the basics of a warcaster casting a spell, we all kind of get. I mean, offensive, non-offensive, upkeep, non-upkeep. We can go in hours doc talking about that, and we probably will. But what I think confuses me the most is non-warcasters casting a spell. 
And I think that that's what I'd really like to delve into tonight. So I'm going to throw you for a loop. Tell me a bit about how the, the whole order of operations of a non-Warcaster casting a spell. Well, a non-Warcaster will always have a spell as a special attack or a special um, action. It will be a star, what, what you'll often hear called a star action or a star attack on their mm -hmm. card. And next to the name of it, um, say Hexbolt, you'll see a magic ability with a number after it. So it'll say Hexbolt, magic ability, say seven. What that will mean is that like the seven focus on a caster, the magic ability, the, the base stat that you're adding the 2d6 to will be that number. So and a lot of those cases, seven. it's a six or a seven, which yeah, means in a lot of cases they're better high. than a than, than caster. Now, okay, so remember, because it is a star attack or a star action, it has to happen during that part of the model's activation. So usually what will happen is a model will activate, they will do their movement, and then as their action, they will do this magical ability, whether it be uh, creating a cloud or throwing a hex bolt or yeah. whatever. Okay, so Mark andre to point it in your direction and get some of your insight. When in your, like, what are the situations where a spellcaster can't cast a spell? Just off the top of your head. Uh, if you give your, your unit a charge order, uh, I mean, their combat action at that point has to be a melee attack. So unless you have a spell hypothetically that says you can char you can use this on a charge, for example, like Tremor on a Rune Shaper, you cannot cast that spell after charging or, of course, running either. Um, so that'd be one, so one pretty big uh, rule that comes into effect with things like Hex Hunters, uh, Ayana and Hold if you decide to charge with them, or uh, even the Haley Threes uh, in the case of um, Grandma Haley or future Haley. Um, so that'd be one instance. Another obvious instance is when you have a model saying you can't cast spells, uh, or if you, for some reason, are suffering an effect that says you can't do special actions or special attacks. Um, so something like Denegro One's ability, which says, I think her feet prohibits you from making special attacks, which means you could not cast a spell that was an attack, but you could cast a spell that was just a, like a, that was not an attack. So the star action one. Yeah, so, so you could do, like, Ragman's Death Field, but you could not do Ayana's Kiss of Lilis, for example. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Maelstrom, throwing it in your direction. Yes. Spells, what's the most com confusing thing for you when it comes to dealing with spells? Well, I just, I'm, I'm still learning uh, the whole Horde's um, casting, War Beast casting different... Anima? Anima uh, of different War Beasts and... Yeah, so it's... Okay, it's, so uh, this is a great point then. Because Animus become the Warcaster spells, correct? Am right. I, am I putting the that warcaster directly? The Warcaster Warlock. Uh, war, sorry, the Warlock, warlock specifically. Yeah. Can cast the spell. Is, of, uh, is allowed to cast the Animai of a beast in their battle group as a spell. The spell, once cast, counts as both an Animai and as a spell. So anything that affects either an Animai or a spell will affect that effect. Okay, so it will affect that effect. Don't like the that. the big question is, you're allowed to have one animi, one spell, one upkeep, or one. What are the th what are the spells that I can have on something? What at are any the given, things that you can? What have? are the things I can have at any given time? So you can have uh, one upkeep uh, friendly, one upkeep enemy, one animi friendly, one animi enemy, and then. I believe it's any number of non-upkeepable spells. Oh, okay. So that, that makes a big difference. That I can throw six non-upkeeps on you yeah. if I happen to have those. But the upkeeps... So let's say the, war ca the, the Warlock casts the Animai and it is an upkeep. Does it still qualify as an Animai or does it cancel out an upkeep that you've already got on... Remember, it is always counted as an Animai and a spell. So it will eat up that Animai slot. Man, oh man, that's, see, there's why it's not mm -hmm. as easy as you think. It, but it's all about wording, once again. Yeah, right. All one, right. One thing we should mention is um, focusers, people with the magic uh, ability, unlike the, um, unlike the units and stuff we've just mentioned that can cast spells, there are, there are very few times that they cannot cast a spell. And a lot of people um, don't think about this. They cannot cast a spell when they run. They cannot cast a spell during their movement, 
and they cannot cast a spell during an attack. Mm. That does leave open a few really interesting things where uh, your warcaster can charge someone, end their movement, before they make their charge attack, they can cast a spell. This will often get you farther than you would be able to get normally. Um, and you can make additional cast-like spells if your charge is successful, even if you kill your primary target. Gotcha. This will allow you, with Warcaster units, to um, move your unit ahead, charge one of your own guys. Uh, even if you kill that guy, your Warcaster is farther up and can make casts. Or let you charge the back of your own ironclad, gate crash, feet, assassination, E. K. and top of two. All right, <laughs> so, Mark andre the question for you is tips for shutting down spellcasting. Your top tips for taking those nasty spellcasters like Haley 2 and just making their lives horrible. Uh, well, it's all about the, the counters at that point. I mean, if you play Circle, for example, you got Druids. You know, nothing within the counter magic uh, guy's uh, range, you know, whatever it is, uh, according to the card, can be targeted by spells or cast spells. So this protects you on both fronts. Um, I mean, if you're playing Menoth, you can pretty much pick anything out of the book, and it probably <laughs> has spell hate in it. Uh, I mean, so that that's definitely one thing, is knowing that if your opponent, especially, you know, if your opponent's going to have an arc node or something, you know they're probably going to want to cast some spells at you. So it's all about leveraging things like Banishing Ward uh, or, uh, well, Banishing Ward's a big one. But anyway, knowing where to put those effects into play. So, for example, uh, you know, if uh, your opponent has a Arc Node with something like, and they have Telekinesis, let's say, we'll say Ron, uh, you probably want to put Banishing Ward on a model that you don't want to be disrupted, moved out of the moved out of the way or something. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's good to keep in mind that if your models cannot be targeted by spells... Like, for example, the Druid, his, his thing says friendly models cannot be targeted with spells within, uh, you know, three inches plus however many models are in the unit. Um, that said, that doesn't stop them from targeting their, like, their own models, their, you know, or your enemy models, essentially. Sweet. It does not stop Cognifex Siphon from casting his blow up his own dread spell. Yes. That's right. That's right. Something like uh, Haley 2 will love to time bomb something like a Storm Pod or a Risen because it still allows her to uh, tag a bunch of models with the debuff. For example. For example. Yet another thing I never think of to do. One thing to note is that ma spells are magic, but the effects that they leave are not. So, for example, if a spell causes a spray attack to go off or an AoE, the spell creates the AoE or the spray, but it does not. it is not the type of damage. So, for example, something that is spell warded will still take AOE damage from a spell targeted at something else. Uh, it, it is magic damage still, but there are a few weird corner case ones. Like if, if we'll go into, say, Crevasse or um, what is it? The one Mordecai has. Uh, shoot, I forget the name. Um, Essence Blast. Yeah. So these, so these are weird spells that basically target a model in, your, in his control area. You remove that model, or in, this, in Crevasse's case, if you kill a model with the initial attack, you get to basically have a spray grow out of that model. That spray, for some, you know, has how the Infernals have ruled it, is not a spell. So you can actually use Essence Blast, or actually Primal Shock is another example. I was going to ask about that, yeah. Yeah, you can use it to target a model that cannot be targeted by spells, because the initial target, and as far as I understand, the only target of the model, is... Uh, well, for Essence Blast and, Pure, and uh, Primal Shock is your own model. That's the only model that ever gets targeted by an actual spell. You are being... When you make the attack, you're targeting it's something... It's a secondary with attack assault. coming from, yeah. the, from the model that's hit. It's almost a fourth attack type. It's a bit strange. Yeah. Uh, but it's really funny when you uh, unleash it on us. It's the Karchev of attack types. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little better than that. The, the one other thing that you weren't thinking of when you thought of stuff. Um... Okay, so to, to go into the really weird conundrums of trying to understand how all this works, just to be a really simpleton on this one, is there a difference between a warlock spell and, uh, and a warcaster's spells at all? Is there any things that I need to be worried about as a new player when I'm looking at 
a Warcaster casting spells. You already touched a bit on, on um, you know, Warcaster can cast at any time as long as it's not during his attack or his movement. Um, so you can't stop in the middle of your attack and go, oh, before I actually tag you with this. Is there any other weird interactions that I need to know about when I'm dealing with spells? Go the ahead, only, Mark. The only one I can think of is that if your caster casts tenacity on a model, uh, because then this is both an animus and a spell, you cannot then have a war beast also throw its own animus, so say a Carnivian, onto that same model. It, well, you could, but it, tenacity would go away. Yeah, it overwrite. It is an animus. I know I've, I've heard a few people doing that sort of thing, and yeah, that so that would be the one thing to make sure people aren't stacking animi, even though one of them is also classified as a spell. It's, right. Uh, yeah, that, that'd be the one thing to watch. Remember out. when? A, remember when a warlock casts an animi, it gets both the spell tag and the animi. And tag. that doesn't make it something different than a spell slash animi. It means that it is both, both a spell, spell and, and an, an animi. animi. Takes up both those slots. Okay, guys, we're gonna. I think we've pretty much covered all the bases we can if there's any questions from the audience please throw them at us um and if you have more questions on spells throw it onto our facebook page and we'll get one of the myriad of intelligent people that know something about spells to answer your questions um we love getting those questions we don't get them often enough please go to our facebook page and ask them we're gonna move we're gonna switch gears a little bit we're actually gonna kind of backtrack because we touched on this uh recently about growing a meta and i think part of growing a meta is uh is is tournaments tournaments mm. are a huge part of of what uh, an active tournament scene is a good sign of a strong meta and an active tournament scene is what is part of what gets new players to keep playing and go out and buy those new models whatever they may be so the round table discussion today is not just about tournaments but it's about going to your first tournament because i think new players most intimidating moment is that day that they're going to their first tournament. Uh, the first tournament I ever went to, I mean, I was nervous as hell. I had, I, and George said to me about 600 times, plan on losing, plan on losing, plan on losing, and just go and have fun. Um, let's start with uh, Maelstrom. You haven't been to a tournament yet. No. You've, you've worked I've as I've watched a, a tournament. <laughs> yeah, well, you've worked on the podcast yeah. during tournaments. Um, and let's talk, let, well, let me direct the question towards you first, Sammy. What was your first tournament like, and how did you feel about it? So my first tournament, um, Aubin, a friend of ours who we're hoping to get on the podcast soon, um, he says to me, my buddy's running a tournament in Trenton. Let's go. So uh, a bunch of us get in a vehicle. We stay overnight in Kingston because that's a nice close place to uh, put our heads down. And then first thing in the morning, we show up at this beautiful actually location uh in trenton they've got a really nice little game store there um and i am lining up against a whole bunch of people i have never seen before with a list that let's be honest i've never played before um and i spend my entire first game forgetting to allocate focus every single turn nice so nice. i lost that game uh, -huh. uh needless to say uh, but I had a whole lot of fun playing my first opponent, and that was pretty much it. I was hooked. So it, it was scary. Oh, yeah. It you was, made mistakes. It was insane. It was... But it hooked you on the game. Yeah, I, w I loved it. I went down and I said, and I played... What, what really hooked me was the ability to iterate on my list. Mm -hmm. So I have this list. I have this set of models. I go down, and I get to play this set of models, like five times in a row right. or four times in a row in one day. And it allowed me to learn so much faster and so much more than I ever learned at game night, just because at game night I get one, maybe two games in. Uh, that, that day, it was like a month's worth of games compressed into one day. All right, Marc-Andre, to direct the same question towards you, dig back deep. I mean, you were 11 years old. <laughs> um, tell us had, about your it had been a hard day back in grade six no tell me about your first tournament experience and how how it felt for you uh well we'll stick with war machine i think that's <laughs> i think that works um uh, my first tournament was actually in toronto this would have been um geez about five years ago it was fan or maybe four five? anyway uh four years ago yeah uh, in Toronto, actually, because uh, Ottawa back then wasn't really big on the tournament scene. Um, 
And yeah, so I traveled uh, on by the bus, of course, uh, about five and a half, six hours to the filthy brothel, eh, not brothel, hostel, uh, <laughs> <laughs> near uh, the convention center in downtown Toronto, uh, where they only charge $20 a night, which uh, should be indicative of the uh, quality, but I was Same a bit... price as our local brothel, by the way, just to... <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Um, anyway... So that was uh, was interesting, but I, I'll skip all that. I went to this uh, gigantic tournament, probably had 40 to 50 people wow. at least. Uh, this was my first one. I was all excited playing my Signar. I had three lists. Um, it was before character restrictions. It was a different time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I ended up I, – I mean, I was loving it. I had a few very good games with Kane and Siege. And then got to play against uh, Charles, a man I didn't know at the time. He's now one of my WTC teammates. And he uh, absolutely wiped the floor with me. And I was like, wow, you know, this guy's is, this guy is pretty good. Uh, we I ended up winning the rest of my games that day. But uh, it was a really, really interesting game. Probably my favorite one, at least in like the first year of War Machine that I played. Um, I learned a, a ton of stuff. And um, I also just... I guess I had sort of, um, I don't know, I had sort of gotten used, I guess, to sort of doing quite well in the local scene, and just getting stomped like that was really refreshing. Uh, it was really nice to see that I had, like, way, way more to learn than I thought maybe I did at first. It was a really humbling experience, I guess. And uh, Nice to find out that the game had some depth that you didn't right. know was there. Definitely, I was I, and I was playing at the time shamelessly, uh, you know, the cookie cutter, Signar OP bullshit, and he was playing a caster I had I had never even put on the table because I thought he was so bad, and he beat me with it soundly. Well, and and I mean, I'll, I'll give you my my I, I went to a release event first. That was my first sort of like club experience. Uh, I went to a, a weird event at one point at a local game shop that was kind of a game night, but not really. Um, I can't remember what that was all about. It was the, the, you know, it was like six players, but it wasn't a tournament. Um, the one at FDB. Anyway, I went to a couple of sort of group events first, and then I went to my first tournament and, uh, super nervous, blah, 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 blah. But the first thing I learned was, I think the best part was, is, is that I learned that there are great players out there and to see what a great player does changes your perspective of the game and the second thing that really changes your perspective of the game is if you're playing with the same 10 guys like let's take our local group which plays every monday night you're gonna see the same four or five lists every week or four or five factions at least that you might see different lists slight variations but you're not suddenly somebody's gonna throw men off at you and there's nobody who plays men off at your local game store and it's going to just throw you out the window and and change the way you play and suddenly it cracks some ideas open. You're going to learn things from other players. But past our first experiences, let's talk a bit about encouraging other people to go to, to their first room because I think that that's an intimidating thing, especially if you don't have a group like ours, which is already playing a lot that are, you know, rah, 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 let's go to tournaments. Why go to your first tournament? That's the first thing. Like, I am enjoying having fun at my local gaming store. Why, George? Um, I would say meeting people who you would not going to meet at your local game store. One of the biggest things that is awesome about War Machine is the humans. Like, it's a, it's a good game, don't get me wrong, but what makes it a great game, what makes it an amazing experience, is going to a tournament playing uh milling around with a whole bunch of people and then getting the first pairings and hearing everybody go ooh when certain people are matched up against certain other people and you're like why 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 are they ooing what's going on and then after the first round everybody is sitting around and talking about their games and saying okay how did you do how did i do okay who do you think's going to get paired next that social experience is I think the greatest part of the game. Um, I, I think that's what that's what you should be doing at a tournament. Is you know if you're winning great games, all mo all the better. But really, what you should be there for is the camaraderie, is the people, is is, is just the fun of going out and doing some competitive fun. Sweet, Mark Andre, how do I get the most fun out of my first con? 
first con. Uh, or 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 tournament. How do I how do I have the most fun at my first tournament, my first con, my first the first big event I go to? How do I get the most fun out of it? I think uh, I think you got to go with uh, few expectations about how you'll perform. Uh, for one thing, I think you have to meet as many people as you can, especially if you're if you're new to it. Like just introduce yourself as much as you can. You know, we nerds sometimes not the most socially, uh, you know. Uh, I guess socially uh, apt people, but this is this is our this is the place to do it. This is the place to come out of your shell if you're in one. Say hi to people, you know. Talk about whatever. I mean, talk about games. Obviously, that's the easy, uh, easy, easy uh, begin. You know, easy icebreaker. But I mean, yeah, just introduce yourself to people because th- like those. If you're the type of person that likes to go to tournaments a lot, or you know, if you're doing this in your local meta, these are the people you're going to be seeing. You know few times a month maybe yeah, these, yeah. These, are, these are you know it's these are going to be your your friends in this weird you know hobby of ours and uh yeah it's good to get started early so maelstrom we have something coming from the guys on the board yeah uh frag palm just wanted to ask mark a question sure bring it on uh how many factions do you own mark andre let me see or do you I, just want to list the ones you don't own? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I technically Which, what don't you own? <laughs> I definitely don't have minions, and I'm technically missing the casters for Mercs. So, so <laughs> which, which so, means so he has. So you have all the Mercs. It's just you haven't bothered to pick up any of the casters. I guess I, I'm missing a few more Jacks to make them work as well. All right. But overall, so, yeah. So uh, throwing this to you, Semi-Auto Magic, what should I bring to my first tournament? Um. Well. Obvious stuff is obvious. Um, bring your models, bring your tape measure, bring your dice, bring your tokens, all that kind of stuff. So bring all the stuff you'd normally bring for a game. I think that that's actually something you should talk. We should just bring tokens. Oh, okay. It's actually kind of not. Okay, so good. this say this is your first actual tournament. Um, make sure you have a set of tokens of some variety. Grab the PP ones. Grab the Muse on Minis ones. I like the Muse ones myself, but I know they're expensive. A lot cheaper to get the, the PP ones, but have a set of tokens. Tokening is so important. Always think to yourself, if I walked away from this game and somebody else had to pick up my game where it is, could they, do they have all the information that they need in front of them? And that's how I always do it. If there's any effect on the board that um, they would need to know about, that means that I should have a token out of it because my opponent needs to know about and it. And your models should be relatively built to a point where at least they're discernible. If yeah. you show up with, with <laughs> like a head on a piece of blue tack on a base, you might end up or or a bunch of cardboard cutouts. I don't know who would do something <laughs> crazy like that. Um, <laughs> but also make sure you have your tape measure, have your dice, all those kind of things. Yeah. But once you have the bits of the game. I think the things that are really the first thing that is really important to bring to your first tournament is a two dollar plastic tray from the dollar store. If you're really lucky, with a piece of small shelf liner in the bottom. When you're you in really want to blow that extra. If you want to blow that extra buck fifty, um, <laughs> what you got to do when you're in a tournament is you've got to move from table to table relatively quickly. Um, if you're a player like me who tends to go to time. Well, you're going to need to move relatively quickly to your next game. And having a tray that you can put all your models on is, is perhaps the biggest one thing that you don't necessarily need at a normal night, but is just so uh, absolutely and, handy. And it's so funny because you don't think of trays unless you've been to a tournament and somebody's like, you're like, oh, shit. You, you that get, tray would be super you, uh, you damn get, it. You get to a tournament and you look around and everybody else is pulling these trays out. Trying to put it back. And, and you're, you're like, trying to put it back in your battle. Yeah, and you're like, what the heck's going on? All right, so to change it up a bit, so we've we've dealt with some stuff for new players. So let's talk about so old players, players that have been <laughs> around the block a couple times. Mark Andre, how do we become as the older players, as the ones that have been around for a year, maybe two, maybe three, maybe eighteen? How do we become better tournament players? How do we become a better part of our community? Not just a better, you know, get better scores, screw the score. How do we, like, in your experience, who are the best people to play against, win or lose? The, uh, I mean, I think a good way to get better is to ask your opponent how you can improve your game. And conversely, to always 
it will offer to do the same for your opponent. I think that not only makes you be a better player, it also just sort of you know lightens the mood. If, for example, there was a pretty crushing loss on one side, uh, of course it's good to it's good to gauge and test and try to make sure that the other player is going to be receptive to that question or that comment. Uh, you want to go in easy on that because some some people get a little they shouldn't, but some people get a little testy when you uh, when you offer advice. Um, but I think I think that's one one key thing, at least in my opinion, to get better and also just to kind of foster the dialogue. If if people are a little upset at the end of a game and it happens, people get tilted by dice sometimes or whatever. Um, it's good to like just kind of break the break the tension and just go, hey, you know, what do you think I could have done better? What uh, what do you think you should have done better, etc. That sort of stuff. No, um, point of order: Don't do that if you just raffle stomp the guy. <laughs> so what do you think I could do to be better? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, 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 that's fair. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to know is, um, let's talk a bit, just briefly, we got about a minute left in this segment. Uh, I'm going to throw this out to Marc-Andre first. Sportsmanship. What do you think are the hallmarks of sportsmanship in a tournament setting? What what makes a good uh, high-level sportsmanship player? I think someone, and this is, uh, I, think, uh, I think I may be in the minority in this, but I think uh, one thing is to... Um, you know, when you make a mistake, uh, own it. Don't don't ask your opponent if you can take something back. And I, I'm not I'm not perfect on this. I don't think anyone is. But when you make a mistake, an obvious one that you probably didn't think you would make, uh, that's easily correctable. You should still just own it and go. You know what? I I made the error, and we're gonna see how the game goes from here. <laughs> it may have I, lost me the game, but it'll be fun no matter what happens. I think that may be the one hardest thing to do in war machine is to own your mistakes absolutely you have to forget your ego for you know for the time being when you do it but you know what that sort of stuff happens and yeah well, and let's be honest we, it, often with with players as we get better the difference between winning and losing is the mistakes you make and mm -hmm. if you can't own your mistake if you can't own it then then all you're doing is asking the other player to let you be you're asking them to, to, oh, just let me take that back, that thing that would have lost me the game in a lot of cases. I think that that's a great point. I think the only other thing I would say is laugh. <laughs> when something goes wrong, don't get angry. Find a reason to find it funny. Try to be loud. Try. I mean, for me, when I'm playing a tournament, my whole thing is be the loudest, funnest guy in the room. Be the guy that... When, loud may be the wrong word, but be the guy that everybody wants to play a game against just because they know it'll be a blast. A, an interesting thing that I have found really helps me, especially when I lose, and I do that a lot, is to be my opponent's biggest fan. To be actively rooting for Absolutely. your opponent to do awesome things, I find really helps because when you're looking forward to seeing something really neat happen, even if it's happening to you, I, th I find that that helps not only my opponent, um, you know, feel good about what he's doing, but helps me to not feel like, oh, God, this guy's stomping me again. It, it's like, oh, man, I get to see this. I finally get to see that interaction. Yeah, I finally get to see yeah. this Warjack eat 12 guys. Like, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think just to close all this out, I, the other thing I want to say to all new players, that if you're worried about your meta dissolving, if you love this game and want to see it grow part of watching your meta grow is to go to tournaments be an active part of your community don't be afraid of them people who are afraid of tournaments are afraid of their community are afraid of honestly if you come to any one of our tournaments that you and i are at or, or mark andre's at we're as a group going to try to make it a good experience for you and that's almost everybody's you know that's what we're all trying to do we're all trying to have fun so let's do it. But unfortunately, guys, that entire conversation is over because it's time for... The Lightning Round. The Lightning Round. That's right. Ten questions. Ten oh, yeah. difficult, warm hoods related questions. Ten Our more points for Marc-Andre. Ten more points. Currently, the leader in the point standing for this season is Marc-Andre with a whopping 13 points. It's kind of unassailable. C can I cash in those points for... Uh, uh, Invitational series points. You can actually, <laughs> uh, it's actually we have an invitational series, but it's actually just you playing a game against Maelstrom. So you can. Oh, Jesus. You can That's not his, cool. At his house. <laughs> at his house on a Saturday 
Uh, but sometimes he has beer. But I'll learn so much. But you have to bring beer, actually. You gotta yeah, bring it's, your own. It's, it's not it's a not, good invitational. But <laughs> here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask... <laughs> it's the worst invitational ever. You guys. And it's just two dudes, <laughs> and he may or may not be wearing a shirt. All right. Ugh, so, ladies and gentlemen... Not. <laughs> uh, so you guys know the rules. Just buzz in by going, eh, if you know the answer. Uh, I've tried to make these questions as balanced as possible because we've had some, you know, it's, 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 these are difficult. So question number one, what is the name of the world of Worma Hordes? Eh. Can? It is Can. All right. Now question number two, what is Gatorix's animus? Eh. Mark andre believe it is ornery it is ornery very good question number three who won the wtc in 2013 eh. mark andre i think that was team poland reckless it was team poland red team Damn. poland red i'll give you half a point for getting poland though so mark andre's at 1.5 semi-automatic at one point we move on to question number four what book slash expansion introduced battle engines Ooh, i'm gonna say domination it was wrath it was oh, wrath. wrath it was wrath so no points for any right, domination else. was hordes oh of course duh what is the cost of the spell broadside eh. mark andre it's gonna be three it is three focus very good that's 2.5 points for mark andre i believe you're at one point still semi-automatic Maelstrom, are you going to play? or uh, you're, <laughs> um, You know all the answers already. Yeah, so... I, I want to let you guys have a chance. Yeah, you, right? got, you want everybody to have a chance. <laughs> all right. The name of the ruler of the Crix nation. Eh. Torok? It is Lord Torok. Also known as the Dragon, Dragon Father. Father. All right. I would have accepted both, but you get a point for Lord Torok. Uh, question number seven. What is the full name of the Butcher? Eh. Mark Andre. It's uh, Orsis Zoktavir. It is Orsis Zoktavir. <laughs> Question number eight. <laughs> name the full name of both Cephalix casters. Eh. George. Exelon Thexus and Cognifex Siphon. Ah, there you go, George. Very good. You got them both. And and, and you get to face. Well, that's title and name. Well, there but... you go. But you needed the full name and it's fine. Yeah, what about Thexus' last name? Texas has a last name? <laughs> when the guy <laughs> asking the question doesn't like, no. <laughs> and then the, 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 one, the one Cephalix player in the room. You, Our, only find out, you only find out when he makes you into a drudge. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, yeah there we go. It turns out it's Bill. It's not that <laughs> exciting. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number nine. The, this is a tough one. The magic ability number of a pharaoh bone grinder. Eh. It's six. It is six. Jesus Christ, man. I, I love them. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say seven, but... All right. Last question. It's for five points. It's mine. You ready? You ready on this one? Should, oh, yeah. should we turn off Mark andres microphone? Yeah, I can, just, I can just mute him. <laughs> <laughs> what is the range on a Defiler's Sludge Cannon? Twelve. It is twelve! Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Five points! <laughs> that? Wait a second, I gotta do the calculations. So defiler? on the defiler sludge it is range eight. That's not what I had. <laughs> we're opening it's up twelve. We're, we're <laughs> opening up he yeah, I mean, just declared it. Hold, <laughs> on. Hold on. That I was gotta, a good guess, right? I gotta look at it. I was pretty sure it was eight as well, but I wasn't gonna say anything. Oh, you guys. Do I really have to look this up now? I thought totally sure it was twelve. <laughs> Judge. Yeah, I'm working on it. Our war room's got to open up. So while we close out, George, while I look up, because apparently Jason may not get his five points, Damn and he was really excited about because I, I may have screwed so up. excited. Tell me about some of the local events that are coming up. So um, the next event we have coming up is our Invitational Series. Um, that is on August 30th. Um, it's the next one in our big series that we have here in Ottawa. But much more important than that, the next, uh, I believe it's the next weekend, September 5th and 6th is a War Machine weekend invitational event and that is blood and iron we still have lots of spots left for that so go to blood and iron dot eventzilla dot net and uh, get your tickets now i hate to say this jason 
I, I wrote then down, don't. I wrote down the then pow. For some <laughs> it is actually a. You've been schooled. Oh, you had, well. you had those dreams, though. It was a beautiful, beautiful, it was beautiful, a beautiful moment. dream. Mm-hmm. Any other events that we need to be prepared prepared for? There, no, George? those are the ones that we've got right now. Um, there is a Kingston event coming up, but that won't be till October. Uh, we do have CGX coming up um, in October as well here in Ottawa. Uh, Marco Andre, any uh, Toronto events that are coming up that we should know about? Oh, uh, well, I mean, this, we've got the Star Wars Invitational Final in uh, ten days. So top 16 from my Star Wars uh, circuit going on the past eight months is uh, culminating. Should be a fun time. Uh, but events that uh, you know anyone can come to. Uh, we've got. I don't know. We don't have any big big tournaments. Next weekend is the um, the the 29th is our Collectors In qualifier. This is actually in Buffalo, New York. Mm. That's like you know two two and a half hours from uh, Toronto here. And that's part of the World Ender series. And you Americans that are in that Buffalo, New York area, that's something you guys can attend. Yeah. Sweet. All right, guys. Unfortunately, uh, the, we actually, the death clock has timed out. We have all lost by, <laughs> due to death clock. Um, if you want to catch the show, if you are listening to it on iTunes and you haven't watched us live, remember that we Twitch every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Twitch pg underscore semi-auto magic um you can also watch the broadcast the like an hour after we're done <laughs> on youtube on our youtube channel please join us in the conversation on facebook and twitter you can also find our web page from there and from a myriad of other ways finally the podcast is available on both soundcloud and youtube thank and you again iTunes. and itunes um thank you so much mark andre for joining us for a second round we thank will thank you for having me we'll probably have you back on the show in a few weeks <laughs> knowing how everything shakes out we love having you on because you just know so goddamn much it makes us so mutant them next time sick <laughs> maelstrom thanks for uh it's bit, uh, to my buddy maelstrom for running the stream hope everybody on the stream enjoyed your banter with maelstrom and of course to my host pg yes. semi-auto magic thank you very much